Welcome to 3D from Nothing, powered by Metal Might, the show where you will learn all about 3D printing and additive technology. I'm your host, Tom Jendik. Metal Might is a full service machine shop that specializes in five and six access CNC machining, CNC grinding, wire EDM, and 3D printing. We have a 50 plus year history in the corporation, which was started by my father, Michael Jendik III. I took over as CEO in 2009 continuing the manufacturing legacy today as a third generation owner. In these programs, you'll learn what kind of printers are out there, what kind of materials you can print on, who are using these printers, what kinds of things you should be looking at printing, as well as hearing from experts in the field through interviews that we'll be conducting. As always, you can go to our website, 3dfromnothing.com. There'll be some free giveaways, you'll see what we're doing, and there'll be links to different things where you can comment, learn more about what we've talked about. And you'll learn about where the name comes from, which was my father, who said someday we'll make parts out of nothing. And that's just what we're doing today with 3D printing and additive technology. Today we have a really special guest. I'm excited to introduce Greg Paulson from Zometry. Zometry, from what we've read about on the web, advertises that you go from prototyping to production. They offer a range of solutions to help you develop effective prototypes and scale up your production parts. You can make custom parts on demand using over 70 materials and 15 processes. They have a network of over 5,000 highly vetted manufacturers and skilled applications engineers to help work for you. Greg and I uh, got had a chance to meet not too long ago. Metal Might actually became one of these highly vetted uh, manufacturers for Zometry. Greg and I chatted a little bit about his vast history here in 3D printing and, and with Zometry. And so we're excited to bring that uh, conversation today. Greg, welcome to our show. Hey, happy to be here. And uh, yeah, it's it's fun. I think we were we were actually talking beforehand. You're like se- 60 materials. I'm like it's 70 now. Like you know, we we just had some additions to the to the Zometry family while we auto quote an offer. So yeah, we're yeah. always growing and and working more. I think that's a great place to start too. I mean, not only are you always growing, but you're not that old. I mean, how old is Zometry? It's only been around. It's, it's not even 10 years, right? Yeah, we we were founded in late 2013, really started making parts early 2014. I actually was a an early hire. I was joined on when uh, the entire company could sit uh, comfortably with space between us at a at a small conference table. Oh. Now we're over 400 employees, but over the past 7 years, we've grown, you know, significantly, added more technologies, more processes, and increased this marketplace, you know, this, we, we actually work with our customers to solve their, you know, solve the problems for manufacturing. And we also distribute that work. So our distributive manufacturing platform to vetted suppliers across the nation and also across the globe. So we've gone from a few of us to 400 employees, you know, having supply, supply base in shop, like some machining and 3D printing to now over 5,000 manufacturers. It's, it's been quite the ride. Yeah. yeah, well, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So I think one of the ways you and I got introduced to each other is I was doing some research and who are the the largest on-demand suppliers on, on the web and, and around word of mouth came about that there was there was these three guys. There was, and, and we'll mention their names here because we're, we're all friendly competitors, right? But there was this uh, 3D Hubs, Proto Labs, and Zometry. And uh, I had never heard, I'd heard of Protolabs, I'd never heard of 3D hubs, I'd never heard of Zometry. And as you and I got introduced, uh, you, you were the one who informed me that uh, 3D hubs was actually bought out by Protolabs. So really now uh, it's down to Protolabs and Zometry. And then as I was looking a little bit more on what the web had to say, let's see, I found this article. It's that Zometry is the largest U.S. marketplace for custom manufacturing. And I, I just said to you uh, last week, I said, that's quite a title to hold, uh, you know, I don't, and I don't know what that's based on, but let's talk for a second about, you know, A, what, what Zometry is and what it offers to maybe someone that's never heard of it, but then B, what sets you apart from some of these friendly competitors and why people would be excited to, to check out your site. Absolutely. And first off, we don't have competitors. We have potential suppliers. Uh, you <laughs> perfect, know, that's, that's, that's the power of a marketplace, right? Is, is, you know, we're, we're, we're here to, you know, raise awareness and get work and give work, uh, you know, so we're, we're raising both sides of for like for the, from the customer side and from the supplier side, we're trying to float both boats at the same time. But yeah, what, you know, I think it goes back to what is Zometry, right? And, and, and what do we do? And I think, I think you've been there. You're, you're both a, you're both a supplier, right? You know, Metal Mike, you have fantastic capabilities in your shop. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, you may have a customer that comes in and says, 
hey, you know what? I actually need this, this sheet metal element or this, this other thing that you're like, wow, you know, I can do all this stuff, but this I need to source out. And this happens right. to manufacturers. We have a large space of manufacturers and customers and customers who don't have their own manufacturing need stuff made too. Right. But sometimes that's, it's, it's hard. You, you know, you, you know, a lot of times you're Google searching, you're looking around for different shops. Maybe your ERP has some suppliers that are local. And if you think about the competitive bid process, it's usually shoot that, that package out to a few uh, folks and wait and wait for responses. And it, the weird thing about competitive bid is you almost expect the prices to be wildly fluctuating, the lead times to be wildly fluctuating, which is just a weird expectation, right? It's just, right. It's just weird that we were trained to like expect that. Mm-hmm. And, and this is, this, what Zometry saw was that potential. There's, there's potential there. Like, why is it that I expect to have wildly different pricing and wildly different lead times? Why is it that I'm working uh, only local? You know, a lot of it's just the, right. the time and effort to figure out who's out there is, is just is just too much. And and for that, you're you're sacrificing potentially some competitive competitiveness. Zometry built a platform that solved some of those initial problems, which is, you know, from a customer standpoint, I need parts. You know, what's in it for me? We took that RFQ process and turned it into a digital auto quote. And not, not just for like 3D printing, like not just for like volume size, here's your quote. Like this is, this is for complex machine parts and, you know, sheet metal parts, uh, your thing cast, you, you name it. And you upload a 3D model. We actually interpret that using some, uh, something called comp- computational geometry. And we, and we use machine learning. So a type of AI that looks at that and does a couple of things instantaneously. First off, it's like, Based off these geometry, the geometry of this part and some things, I think this is a CNC. You know, it, it so it tries to help guide you and being like, I'm pretty sure this is a CNC part, or I'm pretty sure this is a selective laser center 3D part, or or whatnot. And so it first chooses that, and then it'll also also provide pricing and lead time. So now that's big. I think it's a CNC price price uh, part. Here's your uh, price. Here's your lead time for quantity one, 661 aluminum. And you can always be like, hey, actually, it's you know it's 3D printed or I'm doing a prototype or, or you could change it. Actually it's titanium and you could change that out and, and get your pricing, but you're no longer sitting there waiting. You just upload your part and you get instant pricing that's actionable. Like I could press buy right now. Uh, when you press buy, that's when our marketplace kicks into action. So if you're thinking about like the customer, it's almost like Amazon. Like you're like, hey, you know, click, click buy. It's like Amazon, but you're specifying the part you need. You're not, you're not selecting from a list because you're looking for your manufacturing need. From a, from a supplier standpoint, our supplier marketplace essentially has a job board. It's almost like an Uber experience where it's like, hey, there's a gig that fits metal might super well. Like it's like, this is a, you know, a live turn, a, you know, lathe component or multi-axis component, a, you know, high spec, high, you know, tight details. It's going to, after it gets uh, milled in 7075 aluminum, uh, it's going to need to go through anodize and uh, then install some keen inserts or something like that, mm-hmm. or, or key certs. And, and it's like, it's perfect for your shop. And so you're able to take a look at that and see what you get paid for it and when it's due. So you're able to look at those specs and say, you know what, I got capacity for that. That's awesome. Click. It's an instant purchase order. Nice. And, and it's, it's uh, just an amazing experience because you're not sending out your sales force. You're, you're not, you may not ever have been able to be connected with that customer's needs because of location or, or just maybe not the sales force to expand out there. And so for these suppliers, we're almost like a storefront. Like, you know, we're like your, your storefront and we're trying to direct work that's like relevant to you. Right. Uh, so... So yeah. <laughs> if we if, like back up one second. So it's funny, Zometry, first of all, for the people that, that aren't on the visual, we can read it on your shirt here, but for the people listening to us in the podcast, I had some of my, my staff, when they saw the name recently, they, they were trying to say, is it exometry or exometer? And, and I said, Zometry. So it's, it's X O M E T R Y, right? Zometry. And yeah. I don't know where the name comes from. I don't know if you have any history on that, but it's sort of geometry with the X factor, maybe. Or... It's I, I actually I'll take your definition. Yeah, it's <laughs> I think I think we wanted you know sometimes a company will make a, a you know make a name like Precision Machining Incorporated or something like that. Yeah. I'm almost positive there's like a hundred of them out there right now with that <laughs> name, but you know trying to say like what they do. And I think in our case because we want to do so much, we wanted to create a name that 
as we build our brand would be identifiable with like what we do. So I, I think that you're right. The geometry aspect of the of the name is definitely a part of that. The X the X factor, like this kind of technical revolution. I'm 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 sure on a mission statement somewhere we have something super big and co- like uh, and complicated <laughs> about it. But you know we we like making parts and I think we use technology to drive yeah. that to that. And this is you know this is well t- t- tell 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 the CEO on your next meeting that the geometry of the X factor was metal my suggestion. So uh, exactly easier easier for us uh, blue collar guys to remember. And I, I just I got a joke though. I actually when we when we changed our name to Zometry because early on we had a different name and like within the first year and we we changed it to this. I actually went to our our marketing lead at the time. I was like, buy z o m e t r y dot com right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we we own z o m e t r y dot com just to catch wow. those misspellings. Yeah. There you go. Hey, that was probably a genius move. So <laughs> the 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 less ethical employee would have just bought it yourself and then sold it back oh, yeah. to them for for a hundred thousand dollars, right? So once somebody makes their way, you know, as I did to, to exometry or .com, the first thing you see is this, this term, what I found interesting, which is everything you just explained in the last five minutes, it says get instant quotes. So you don't just get a quote. Everybody's website says get a quote, but you say say instant quote. So I actually did it as a, as a consumer, had a couple of files. I popped it on there and I, I got to say it was pretty instant. It was within, you know, by the time I uploaded it and double checked that I had selected the right material in the bottom right corner. There was my checkout price. I think it even included shipping. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I, and I ordered it. I'm happy to say I have a, uh, so that that was last week, Thursday or Friday. And last night we're getting ready for dinner and some delivery truck drops off a box at my house because I had it sent to my house. And my wife says, Zometry delivering to the house. What's that? And I said, oh, let's open it up. (laughs) So I I opened it up and there's the piece I ordered. It's the all 10 material that you and I had actually talked about. And so I, I've got, I've got my instant quote and my almost instant part in my hand a couple of days later. So I was pretty excited to, to experience the speed and the accuracy of how it came out. Part looks great, by the way, you and I had talked about whether it needed machining or whether it'd be okay right out of the printer. And it, it looks great to me. I'm going to have my, my quality lab check it out, but I think we're right there. So, so that was the experience. But what I also wanted to talk about here for our listeners is on the uh, website with the instant quote, obviously that was a 3D printed part, which you guys uh, are, are the front runners in that industry. There was a lot of options as I started playing around. There was, as you, you mentioned, all sorts of subtractive options. There's machining. I think there was, there was urethane. There was uh, plastic injection molding. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, typically somebody's not ordering one out of a plastic injection mold. I and mean, I guess we could, you could talk about that, but Somebody that might want five thousand or ten thousand can order from you. Is that is that what we're looking at there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I like to do is I I like to work with customers on how they scale as they work through product development. And in my background before working in Zometry was in a product development company where a lot of the goal for that because we were working for, we had some internal IP that we built, but we also worked with clients. So a lot of our goal was to build that iterative prototyping cycle, test, validate as we went along. And actually, I use some industrial 3D printing in my job. And my 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 experience, I've you know worked with about a dozen additive manufacturing processes, and we offer eight additive manufacturing processes at Zometry, by the way. And 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 I, I know them really well because I was validating them on the job and breaking them and stuff. But I know right. this, I know that depending on what my goal is, when I am, you know, when I'm making a part, there's, there's like, there's different processes that are just great for it. So I may use something like selective laser centering or HP multi-jet fusion or FDM 3D printing for early stage iterative prototypes and evaluation because those all create you know some very nice durable pieces that I could use. You know, tolerances are machine or mold tolerances, but they're still pretty dang good. And mm-hmm. I could get, you know, I could get some function out of them. If I if my end goal is to move to something like injection molding, I may then transition to something that is tighter tolerance, but still in the 3D printing realm. So I may actually move to stereolithography or even carbon DLS. And sometimes I may like carbon DLS so much I could just create the create my production parts with it as well. But I can move to that because it's smoother surface finish, feels more like a plastic. So like when you're tr- you know working a concept model, you're trying to get market acceptance. They're like, hey, you know, this is I, they get it more. They don't see the layer lines that you may traditionally see with like FDM, for example. Right. And and it also helps me do a fit check, which makes sure that I did tune my part for 3D printing. If my goal is for injection molding, ultimately I could do an SLA, you know, see how these parts fit together or against that assembly. 
and then say, this is good, let's release this CAD and work, you know, and, and validate our, our molding process. But with Zometry, we have experts in all these fields. So we could help you, you know, help you learn with the choose and why and work with you from that, uh, you know, rapid iteration concept model up to production or essentially anywhere you are in that product development process. You could, you could just say, I'm here. And we're like, let's go. You know, a lot of our machine work for aerospace or automotive, they have fully spec'd out drawings. Like they know what they want, right? So it's, it's very easy for them to, you know, to go upload and say, hey, this is going to be a you know, machine part, Delrin, you know, tight tolerances in six locations. Here's my technical drawing, upload, you know, have that attached to it. And it's just, you know, boom, 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 here's price and go. Uh, yeah. And then with that, like I say, one of the things I saw, not only in, in products you can order, but was the finishing. And it looked like Zometry had an amazing repertoire of finishing available. I actually saw, I don't know if you can speak to this, but it said silk screening, like laser printing and silk screening. So one of the things I saw on there, since I'm also a supplier now, one of the bids I saw on there was a dashboard. Somebody had an aluminum dashboard and all the labels on all the holes. It looked like a, a cool modern day electric car dashboard. And it said underneath that finishing would be brushed metal finish and silk screen laser. So talk to me about that. Wow. How are you guys able to do all these extra finishes and stuff for a company? Yeah, well, this is the power of distributed manufacturing. You know, every shop has their unique capabilities and sweet spots. You know, a lot of times finishing is a secondary. So finishing still has a more of a local vibe, you know, because you're often working as a, as a manufacturing supplier, going out to your finishing shop, having that finished work done. So that could be a silk screen, which a silk screen is essentially like, I'm not sure if you know how like, you know, t-shirts are made, you know, t-shirts are printed, but a silk screen is actually a, it's not a stamp. You actually take this silk screen, you put this photo resist on, you ablaze where it's, you're going to have the, your letter or print or your logo put. And then you kind of have a little quick fixture that you line it up on your part and you put a, you know, an, an ink over top and that gives you these really stark, beautiful looking letters or, you know, sharp contrast features. And, you know, it's perfect for your like labeling, like a connector panel or housing or, or like logos and themes. But it's, you know, we have that option because we're connected to thousands. You know, we're not yeah. just like in this area where it's like hard to get. Like there's, there are shops that are like, yeah, I do silk screen. I got my local guy and this job looks good and the price looks great. Boom, I'm going to take it. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. in the prototype world, instead of some rough prototype that sort of looks like the finished product, I mean, this is an actual finished product. This may be in a, on a control panel or on a finished vehicle, and, and that came at that price that was instantly quoted from Zometry, right? So that's, that's kind of a yeah. new deal. Yeah, and you can just order one. You know, sometimes, you know, the interesting thing about digital and, you know, direct manufacturing now is it's no longer working with power brokers who have minimum quantities and things where it's like, what's going to, you know, wet my whistle there. You as a, as a customer, you have more leverage, mm -hmm. you know, by having a, you know, a, a distributed platform. And again, you're, you're not choosing all these, you know, from, from these unique lists, we're going to have some tools that help you, you know, kind of find your favorites in, in the future with our supplier marketplace. But this just allows you to be like, this is what I need. This is my spec. Right. Right. Get, can I get my parts to spec? And, and we, we take care of that whole supply chain. That's amazing. And, and then also it's keeping up with new technology. So I know specifically what, you know, what we've been talking about on this podcast is mm -hmm. metal 3D printing. And obviously in our name, Metal Might, we've been into the metal printing for, for only four or five years in-house. We've you know, access to it for 20 years with some of our other suppliers. But with the 70 materials you're now offering, a whole bunch of those are metal 3D printed, right? I mean, you talked about, is it titanium or what, what, what all metals are available? So we, yeah, from our, from our eight additive manufacturing processes that we offer right now, two of those are metal based. So the rest are polymer or photopolymer based. And, and the two main categories for that are direct metal laser sintering or some call it direct metal laser melting. I know, you know, we talk on that a lot and that's, more of a direct print. I have a part that is, you know, fully dense in that, that unique metal. And then I got to post process it a lot. And actually I was just listening to one of your podcasts to get calibrated for this one. You're, you know, one does not simply metal print, right? You, right. you know, metal printing is like step one of six when it comes to getting a finished product, especially if you need tire tolerance as other features to it. Right. But you can get some really complex geometries. You can incorporate, you know, multi-angular symbols that could require like a very complex machining. 
and you can make unmachinable features, you know, internal curved contours, you know, lattice structures, other cool stuff that is unique to additive. But that we were creating an aluminums and steels, stainless, uh, a couple of types of Inconel and titanium are kind of like the, the big ones that are, right. that are regularly available. Some of those auto quotes, some of those require more of a manual look because usually if you're, if you're looking for like Inconel 618, it's like print and, you know, there's right. always a, a, you know, something else that you're doing with that part. Right. Um, the, Which is uh, a nice, the, nice option that you can offer. Cause I know, you know, again, as we talked about with why printing was a good fit at, at Metal Might is because we can offer the, the post-processing. We've had several parts that we've had to sort of leave a lot of stock on the mm-hmm. printer and then put on the five access, you know, and do all sorts of angular tap holes, things like that. And I, I found from personal experience, it is, is best when shops have that control when it comes to metal 3D printing directly of both the printing process and the machining process in the same place, just for what you mentioned. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of times customers are not experienced enough to, to understand what is required uh, to get a certain surface, surface finish, or if they have an O-ring groove or a, port, or a porting hole in a manifold or something like that, what's required so if there's a print along with this, it is not, you know, it's, it's not like SLS where it's just like, you know, press print and go. It's, it's a, you know, there's built setup, there's orientation, like, all right, so what are your critical features here? How am I going to orient this part while mitigating support structures for, for removal later to hit these critical features? And yeah, your point, you may add like 30 or 60 thousandths uh, material on some inner holes to, or even make holes diamonds, uh, you know, sometimes just so it's self-supporting. And, right. and then you could clean them up with a, with an end mill afterwards, but that's, uh, that's its own bag of worms. And it's really, really hard for a customer who just says, make me this to understand all those steps in between. So yeah, when you have the expertise of not just making the form, like making the shape, but like the expertise of actually making that part in the same shop, it is, uh, you know, I just I find it very valuable for just getting a net shape. And then being like, okay, how am I going to hold this now? Okay, how am I going to, like, right. how am I going to indicate this? And there's, I've seen some, you know, I've had some very hard burned hands on the stove moments <laughs> when you talk about it, when a customer, you know, gives a print that is a print assuming CNC machining, then ask for a 3D printing uh, project uh, mm-hmm. because there's nuances in slight, slight curvatures, deformations, especially when you talk about how you put positional tolerances, concentricity tolerances into things that have to do with GDNT. It is a completely different uh, ball game when you're right. doing 3D printing. Right. Well, and, and one of the things we talked about is, is these advancements in materials and finishes. And, and I wanted to cover, uh, I was mm-hmm. telling you the story that 15 years ago, I had a supplier using an EOS laser sintering machine, a nylon 12 product. And he had come up with a way he was doing a lot of air intakes for high performance vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so he had come up with a way to, to 3d print this air intake. And he, in my layman's terms, he dipped it in some sort of nail polish finisher, which sort of put this sealer on it. Cause he said what was happening with these, with these race cars with, with 700 horsepower, they would suck in the air and little fragments of sand would all suck off of the 3d print and ruined his engine. And so when they had this million dollar prototype engine, they, they, I guess they weren't super excited about scrapping it with a 3D printed sand part. So, so he had developed this process and he was sort of known in the Detroit area around, around where we are for doing this. You and I were talking about that. And you said that's actually commercially available now. And it's, it's even something geometry can offer. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, and you know, early days, and I, I was introduced to additive manufacturing, particularly selective laser sintering and some like FDM and stuff. And actually Z Corp, if someone remembers those, those, are, those were the sandstone printers mm-hmm. back around t- 2007. But what I fell in love with was selective laser sintering. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember in 2007, sitting there with other, with the lab lead and, and saying like, if we could figure out an auto- automated way to smooth and dye these parts, like it would just be a game changer because one yeah. of the downsides of these processes is they're very durable, very strong, but the finish of a laser center part is typically uh, matte like a sugar cube. Mm. It doesn't mean that's matte all the way throughout. Like if you cut it through with a bandsaw, it'll look like billet on the inside, but okay. the but the outer, you know, 20 thousandths of an inch or so does have a little bit of a grain structure to it. 
that you know can absorb moisture or get fingerprints on it or you know to your, to your point create little acute stress points and or like you know create create vulnerabilities that can affect performance over time especially when you're moving abrasive through like sand or something and okay. so epoxy dips and gas tank sealants i've seen those use in the past to help smooth through including sandable epoxies are still kind of a a way to go. A lot of times you put some sandable epoxy on, especially if I'm going to paint my part to essentially seal those, those pits. And uh, then I sand through to remove the, uh, some of the upper cap and keep a smooth finish. And then I can prime and paint afterwards. And it creates this, a sealing effect. Well, you know, the question is why haven't I vapor smooth, you know, nylon? You could do it with FDM parts. Like uh, if you're like ABS, for example, can be vapor smooth because it is, it is not chemical resistant to things like acetone mm -hmm. uh, and acetone will just kind of melt it down and melt down on a surface and it'll help fill those voids. Nylon, however, is extremely chemical resistant. You know, you could put in a lot of stuff, you could put it under the hood in your car and like whatever the car drives over and splashes up on it, it's probably going to be okay. Right. And it's a, so it's been very hard to do any type of chemical smoothing for that. In the last few years, there's been a couple companies that have been launching chemical smoothing processes that are actually really cool. They're like self-contained processes for essentially introducing these 3D printed parts. It's not just nylons, it's you know, like altomes, it's you know polycarbonates, it's, it's some other materials that you wouldn't normally vapor smooth, but it introduces these parts in this self-contained chamber to this vapor. That vapor will then degenerate that outer surface and by that, I mean kind of essentially chemically melt it just enough so that it um, creates a little bit of liquid, but it doesn't drip. And then it reforms, that surface reforms and rehardens in the same base material that it is. So in that, in that altum, in that polycarbonate, in that nylon, it's not a new coating, but it reforms in a smoother shell. And it's really exciting because all of a sudden you have 3D printed, cheap 3D printed parts mm -hmm. in a relatively low cost process that are being smoothed to look you know, like, like a molded part in a lot of ways. And to your point, it adds that performance factor. When I smooth out any surface finish, when you talk about metal 3D prints and you post machine, those, surf those surfaces are inherently stronger because you're uh -oh. reducing acute stress points. You're, you're increasing the surface tension is essentially unified. So it's not just disrupted by little peaks and valleys everywhere. It's actually unified and it helps support the other parts of that part and you get more performance. So you get this ceiling aspect, you get higher performance of it. And what I love is it's not me sanding like I'm polishing a headlight for three hours on the part. It's a, it's a racking process that's automated. And that's huge for right. production and, and right. also for costs, cost to the customer, because the second you have an employee on it, you know, you're, you're adding an hourly wage Right. So no matter how part cheap your part is, it, yeah. you know you're paying an hourly wage against that part the second that you ask me to to sand it smooth it. Right. Well, and then I also heard you mention that a lot of parts you're making you mentioned are military and defense. Again, you know, metal might spend in that field for 25 years as a prime contractor. There are these issues with military and defense where things have to be ITAR, you know, DFAR compliant materials, you know, NADCAP. I actually saw those words all popping up on Zometry's page as I was looking for a quote. So you can provide aerospace and military OEMs. You can provide them ITAR compliant and, and those type of products. Yeah. So for all our processes, we have ITAR compliance. So we have essentially a supplier base of that, of that network. The second that you click ITAR, which mm. essentially permanently meta tags your part in its data, so it will always go uh, through a through essentially ITAR export restricted workflow. So it's, it's just essentially becomes invisible oh, wow. uh, to to, the, to uh, anybody outside of that. So you're um, protecting the data. Absolutely, that's that's huge for us because we are you know we're we're a cloud based system, so we actually have the highest level of security. Uh, we're using GovCloud, which is actually like what the government uses to transfer stuff on the cloud cloud base, uh -huh. and. And it keeps our, you know, keeps our information security, you know, compliant with the ever-growing needs that, that, that are out there. But that network is capable and we have redundant suppliers for every single process. <clears throat> I will say when you start talking about NADCAP and things like for finishing, oftentimes those don't pair directly with 3D printing, just what's out there right, right now. Right, right. So that usually moves me towards more towards like CNC machining, sure. which, but yeah, we have, we have parts. You have parts on the road, you know, we have parts in the houses, we have parts in space and, you know, we're able to do aerospace and flight qualified parts. Oh. Now, 
is is flight a, an auto quote close <laughs> but we want to take a look like because yeah. there's this we always want to know it's it's not just making the part it's certifying what you made right, right. and that's right. what that's what as9100 which uh zometry is also as9100 shop that's wow. what that means is like how to actually say we're certain we like we can uh, not just make the shape that you're looking for but we could tell we could document it in a way in which it gives you the confidence from your quality assurance program that it's uh, secure for this application. Wow, and which means your inspection reports and your your CFC packages, those are all AS9100 quality reports, right? Correct, so we have an option. Uh, so you could choose from like a standard inspection or a CMM or one per AS9102. So you can choose that inspection option directly on our site. That's phenomenal. And you, you were also telling me offline that you have one of the highest percentages of domestic suppliers in the network, right? Because you yeah. said you do it, you do have overseas options to be competitive in other areas, but you said you had a very high, if not the highest percentage of domestic options, right? Yeah, about 3,000 of our manufacturing base of 5,000 is, is U.S.-based. And that's, that's because when Zometry started, we started, you know, in the U.S. So, you know, in 2014, we're building parts in the U.S. And it turns out we weren't just making cheap brackets. What, what we got originally was all the hard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it was all the stuff that no one else was, sor- or everybody was having trouble sourcing. So you should have seen, like, because we had an internal shop at that time, and you should have yeah. seen the beautiful parts we were making. I mean, just these gorgeous, extremely complex like wow. it was it was fantastic to walk walk through at the same time like you know you can see the gray hairs forming on our on our machinists <laughs> but the but you know we started ca- like a lot of our 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 workflow and shop was catered to high performance high spec you know we have we have a drawing we have critical tolerances we have critical material uh, requirements finishes to it and so that's why our website was so drawn around that and we built this network around a lot of those domestic requirements Right. Uh, about, about a year and a half ago, Zometry actually acquired a company called Shift that has become Zometry Europe. Uh, so we have we have Zometry.eu, oh. which is the which caters to all our European marketplace, and we actually have uh, manufacturing I think in at least eighteen countries in Europe, and and service all the EU as well as UK and Switzerland. So essentially, if you're in Europe, if you go to type in Zometry, you're going to see Zometry.eu or Zometry.de uh, as as option, and we have you know, you'll see like all these options available as well there. Wow. And, we also, and we also have, we're moving across, right? So like we're moving across the globe. So we have boots on the ground teams in Asia. So a lot of our Asian manufacturing tends to be uh, machining, molding, sheet metal, casting. And, and we have teams there and both our European groups and our U.S. groups are able to access, you know, some of the lower costs and, and capabilities out from Asian manufacturing. I mean, some of the molded products we make for production tend to be out there and they're fantastic. And wow. Wow. So like you say, a small company, seven, eight years old, and you guys have circled the globe now with your, <laughs> with your reach. And so I, I do want to talk about a couple more things here in, in some of the highlights. I know we're getting close on our time, but yeah. as I was Googling, if that's still a proper terms i was web searching i don't know as you're binging yeah i don't don't know whatever whoever whoever's paying for this episode as i was searching the web we always look for current events and i like to talk about that with my my specialists that i'm i'm interviewing but actually one of the things that came up and i found this very interesting especially since i'm now a a zometry supplier one of the articles that came up says uh, zometry helps u.s manufacturers manage cash flow through the launch of zometry pay invoicing as I read through this article, this is amazing. So Zometry, I'll let you explain it a little bit more if you have some, some better understanding of it. But essentially what I read is Zometry offers this credit card. And when a supplier logs on, if, if I bid a job for, for round numbers, let's say it's a thousand dollar job that I'm going to make some, some yep. widgets. Zometry gives 30% of that upfront on the credit card to help buy the material, get it going. And, and you don't want us, you don't want the cash to slow down the process at all. Absolutely. And so it, 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 when big companies get bigger, my experience is the payments get slower. So <laughs> we usually go from 30 days to 60 days to 90 days. And we're, and we're the little guy begging for our money. You guys have come I, out I of the hear you. and offered, offered money up front. I've, so like I said, there's a time for me before Zometry, I worked in, you know, machine shop product development, you know, kind of mixed environment. And the bigger the contract gets, the more it's got closer to 90 or 120 day payments. And right. then you're stuck here where it's like, 
I'm about to get paid $40,000, but I can, I need to pay $18,000 to get these things out of the anodizer first. Yeah, and then yeah. I need to wait 120 days to, yeah. uh, to get paid for that. And, and it's just a, you know, it's, it's a challenging. And when you talk about like 200, what is it? 260,000 small business machine shops in the United States, it, you know, these are, these are sub 20 people shops and payroll is the drop, right? Yeah. And if you can't yeah. do payroll, you can't, your business is gone. Yeah. So cash flow is king. And, and we recognize this and we work with our supplier base, you know, across the U S and across the globe, but we definitely recognize this. So when you mentioned the Zometry advance card, it pairs directly up with the Zometry marketplace. As you have upcoming earnings, it's up to 30% will be essentially create a debit. And uh, it doesn't affect your own credit score. Uh, so, but you can use it to buy your materials, your supplies, your end mills, cutting tools, and you can use this card anywhere. So we, wow. had, we have Zometry Supplies, which is actually our own store where you can buy materials and mills for you know, a good price and get them oh. shipped to you quickly. Wow. But you don't need to. You can go to MSC or you can go to McMaster and, or Online Metals or somewhere and get, get these materials. Use that card and it deducts from your final pay. So say of that $300, you got credit on that $1,000 job. Mm -hmm. uh, so you spend $100 of it. Uh, you're going to get $900 as your wow. payment. But it allows you to just very fluidly move with work without this obstruction of like, oh my gosh, can I pay for that up to upfront expense before I, you know, when I take this job? And we pay regularly, so we pay about net 30s and it automatically invoices. So when you ship that job on our digital workflow, that payment is like the invoice essentially, like you don't need to submit an invoice to us. It's it's already generated and the timer starts. And so it's consistent. So even if our contract is 120, you know, net 120, you're always on like a net 30 with us. So it, it helps too, because you're not dealing with the paperwork and the big stuff. We're able to essentially create that, that front. So I feel like that would be a, I'd love to be a fly on the wall. I feel like there must be a, a team at Zometry that, that literally sat down on day one and said, uh, what are, what are the top three issues in, in on-demand manufacturing? <laughs> And it came up with, you know, people wait too long to get their quotes. They're not getting, you know, competitive suppliers. And then the suppliers aren't getting paid on time. And between software and, and automation processes and paying their suppliers quickly, they've solved all these issues that everyone else has struggled for for 100 years to uh, figure out. Yeah, I, I got to say, I'm... I've, one of the reasons why I'm very passionate about this, you know, this, what we do here is because we are uh, floating both boats. We're not just taking, like, you know, there's, we talked about different, what makes Zometry different, like kind of looping all the way back to the beginning from other places. Mm -hmm. We're, we're paying small business manufacturers, we're paying other, like other manufacturers and we can mm -hmm. become like, sometimes we're their top customer. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we're just a portion of their business. Sometimes we're like 10% of their business, but yeah. either way, like, you know, we're consistent. And other companies tend to like to make their shop bigger. And, right. and so they're like, when they get more work or they, when they push, push forward, they're actually oftentimes taking work away from, you know, local manufacturing mm -hmm. with the services and what we're offering. Our hope is to enhance that, to, to take that, that spindle that's not turning right now, or that printer that's not making and, you know, give it use because the talent's there. And I, I think what I found the best discovery I found with Zometry is there's all this talk about, you know, like, you know, is, is a talent there? And I'm like, honestly, there, there are jobs there. Some jobs actually, you know, they like there's, there's companies that have great capabilities, but don't have enough work and may have to close. And if they could have access to something like Zometry, it doesn't need to be all their pay, but if it helps supplement that and create like a, you know, a consistent revenue stream, you know, it's, it's just amazing to help keep like small businesses, you know, working and, and be, you know, be a partner to them, not just, you know, not just, you know, some you know, random customer or something. And that's, that's what we hope to be. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And it's great that, that, you know, that the team at Zometry has thought about the, the front end and the back end of that transaction and kind of everything in the middle. I know one of the jobs we have in house right now is a Zometry job and it came in and I was talking to my, my leadership team yesterday and they said, this is due in seven days. <laughs> and I said, I said, yeah, and we can't be late. So let's, let's get it done. So we were looking at it and then one of my, my vice presidents sat down with me. We were looking at some of the opportunities on the, on the job board that Zometry has. And uh, he said, oh, this one's perfect. This is a perfect one for Metal Might, you know? And I said, yeah, we were looking at it. And I said, did, did you see the due date? And he goes, no, and it's, it's, it was tomorrow. It was the next day. <laughs> and I said, if, if you think we can do that for tomorrow, then, then for sure, I'll click the button here and we'll take that job. And so we, we had had a side conversation that, you know what? 
we need to get into more, you know, automation and, and kind of figuring out more because these opportunities are great, but uh, the, the one day turnaround or the seven day turnaround as much yeah. as, you know, metal might like to offer that, you know, we're, we're four weeks. I mean, most people order from us for four weeks to order material, write it up, process it, get the, you know, get the lathe guys to do this mill guys to do that quality guys, check it, send it out. That's it's a rate and flow of about four weeks. Nothing Zometry does, it, it seems, is four weeks, and it seems like you guys are pretty light, light there, speed there. There are those out there. To believe me, there are, you know, there are jobs that have a longer lead time. I, a, lot of, a lot of those jobs, especially when you see that, like, two business day type work, a lot of that is, is usually classified by our, by our algorithm. We call it simple parts, but it's usually something that you would be found on, you know, on the network that's usually – you know, suppliers that are able to take that where they have over capacity. Sometimes they have, you know, the metal in house already and are able to just, just run those through. So a lot of times when you see those, those jobs, I know I was talking to a, a team down in Texas that we work with and they, they call them kind of the candy jobs where they were in oil and gas field and the machinist would essentially lunch break it and, you know, and do, do the setups for, for those. But we've, you know, we've seen, you know, we've, like as I mentioned before, we have a high diversity of shops, you know, so like some, some stuff is at, you know, higher echelon, multi-stage, you know, like not just make parts, but, you know, this level of qualification, this level of finishing, et cetera. Some of them are cut and run parts and, you know, we cast just a, a super, super wide net there. Wow. Yeah. And I think it's exciting. I think it's exciting for the, for the end uh, user to, to think about getting their, their part, their product in hand that much quicker. And, and it's excited for, for little shops like Metal Might to get, to get involved and be part of that system as well. So thank you for letting us be a supplier as well as a customer uh, with the Zombie. I, I have to thank you. I mean, I think that's the thing is, you know, we're, you know, we're only as strong as, you know, our supplier base. And, and I know when we were talking earlier, I was like, this is a cool shop. Like, this is a, I'm, I'm really happy that you're, uh, you're looking at the job boards, taking on work. And, and, and I think, as you know, like, as we start with a crawl, then walk, then run approach. So as you take on more work, you build your essentially what's called a partner success score, uh, mm-hmm. but that PSS score, and and as you build that up, it releases both you know parallel work, so work that you can take on you know you know multiple jobs as and, and more and more, as well as your revenue stream. So like how much revenue can you take from a job board? Because sometimes that that early training is just learning how to use the digital workflow, right? And and finding right. out what what fits best for your shop. So exactly what you're saying, like it's it's discovery period. So we don't want you to take like 11 jobs on week one and be like, oh, you know, and they're <laughs> <laughs> all <like>, do tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, and so like that's that's something that you know we've learned, and you know we have some mechanisms. And I I have to mention too, some of our team members are 30, 40 years experience. So just like you, like you know, born and raised in shops. So if you ever have a, something that you're like, hey, you know, how could I X or, or you're running into something where it's like, hey, I'm trying to do this. This setup usually works, but I'm, I'm running into these issues. We yeah. actually have a tech support team like that are oh. experienced machinists that you could call. Okay. They'll, they'll look at your cam and we'll talk through program strategy and stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. Well, I, I will say when I, I was uh, going through the onboarding process, there was some videos for any questions we might have from the technical experts at Zometry and, and, and Greg Paulson himself came on and was uh, some of the, some of the videos. So I, I was pretty impressed that uh, my, th- my thread checking thread, uh, yeah. threaded holes uh, <laughs> video or and this yeah. one, I think you were, you were wearing like the white shirt, you were standing and explaining how things work. So I, I was impressed. I thought, I know that guy. I've spoken to that guy. I'm kind of a big deal now. Well, as we, as we look at the current events, if you, if you could humor me, since you are a specialist, mm-hmm. one of the things that popped up as we were talking about some of this metal 3D printing, and, and these links will be on, on the website, you guys can check it out yourself, but the Beamit Group has developed for additive manufacturing titanium 6242 alloy, which is an is additive manufacturing titanium steel. It provides resistance to high temperatures, a tinsel strength of 1,000. MPA density of 4.5 grams per cubic centimeter. It yields uh, titanium alloy, which withstands temperatures of 550 degrees Celsius and can enable very complex printing shapes. So uh, as you were talking about, you corrected me in the beginning. I think the website said six material geometry offers. Now it's 70 because you know a couple of days have gone by and more has been approved. There's materials being invented as you and I are speaking right now. And there's, so there's another titanium. I know you and I are both looking at stuff that is no longer just on our planet. 
from is going to other planets, which are seeing extreme temperatures, both hot and cold. And so this titanium alloy, this is a pretty mm-hmm. cool, I don't know if you'd seen that ad yet about this new titanium, but that's, that's a pretty cool I, invention. I haven't, I haven't seen that, but I think that's, it's, you know, first off, I know, I am not sure if it's Beamit or Beamit IT. I guess it is Beamit now that you say it. That makes more sense in my head. <laughs> but they, but I know they do a few different types of metal additive manufacturing. So DMLS, mm-hmm. like I mentioned, they also know they do something called electron beam melting, uh, EBM. Yeah. Uh, which is a, it's also a very, very cool system because it doesn't require supports traditionally, like you think about those support structures. Sometimes you have to build what are called like heat sinking fins that kind of go down because it's super hot. You're right. running titanium parts and the whole whole machine platform's like, I'm hanging out at 900 C. Like, you know, right. so it's a, it's a very, very different than direct metal laser centering where the build platform's like a little bit above room temperature, you know, right, times. right. Um, yeah, one of the first podcasts, yeah. our, our VP yeah. Patrick said that they used electron beam welding with the joint fight striker, joint fight striker jet, and they saved a million dollars per plane by doing the titanium electron beam wing spar. Yeah. So there, there's yeah. definitely savings to be had with additive. And then, you know, like I say, as materials get better, that only gets better. And, and I love, I love when I hear about materials specific to additive, because here's the, here's the PR problem with additive is that as a... As an engineer, I, you know, like our, like anybody historically as an engineer has gone to school and learned mostly about subtractive. They've learned mm-hmm. mostly about billet materials, ASTM standard materials. Like, right. you know, when you get 6061, regardless of where you buy it from, you already know what you're getting, right? Right. With additive, it's, it's less analogous because you're growing these parts. So there's other risks and considerations when you're making it. And there's two approaches. One is qualify materials that are familiar to the engineer. So I actually, yeah, I remember like both desktop metal and X1, which we have like, we do binder jet from X1, which is another metal 3D printing process. Both have announced that they have a 6061 qualified. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool because that's a familiar term in the CNC machine world. Yeah. Now, they didn't say what temper it is or anything like that, but uh-huh, they did right. say 6061. Right. But, uh, you know, the other direction, and that's one direction, is let's be familiar. Let's print ABS. Let's print polypropylene. Let's print nylon. Like, let's, let's, let's be familiar. The, the other side of that is, well, what can additive do better? Right. And, and right. you know, you look at these new unique materials, these new alloys, stuff that's really hard to mach- machine, but really easy to grow. Like, a lot of these really hard materials actually behave super well when you're centering them because they don't want to move. They're like, nah, I'm cool where I am. And so you don't, you have less problems with, with how they behave, how they'll flex. Titanium still will misbehave some, but like, you know, some like some miraging steel, for example. Right. And, and so, so it's really cool to see that development. The barrier is always, okay, now I have developed, who's my customer base? And, mm-hmm. and I think that's still the barrier because engineers are still, you know, dragging their feet. And unless there's an entire R&D project around qualifying a titanium material for this thing and you create a customer source because you help them develop that, that application and that part and you're supplying that, it, sometimes it's really hard for these new materials to get adopted or gain momentum in a marketplace just because the engineers are like, but I know when I cut from, you know, TI5, what I'm going to get but if I grow from here, I have a thousand more questions and, right. and getting that adoption and the reason why I may grow apart versus cut apart, you know, is still the big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and like you said, density is huge because I know we just had, uh, we just had a, an aerospace job in the house where we bought the exact material that was spec'd out and we did all the mad cap heat treating and, and we were getting ready to machine and there was a crack in every single part. And so right now, we literally, I just saw some emails this morning, the, the heat treater is arguing with the steel supplier because the steel supplier said the heat treater did, a, did the, the quench and temper wrong. And the heat treater said, no, they didn't. There was a flaw in the material before we started. Well, this is one of these things that we're standing in the background going, either way, I don't have a product that yeah, I can- Yeah, this is unusable. Like, yeah, like you know, I, I'm so, definitely not going to cut apart from this material. Right, yeah. and, and we just don't have that when we when we yeah. print something. I mean, we print 17.4 and Inconel, and that's a, it's, you know, 99.9% dense, and it's, there's mm-hmm. no flaw in the middle of it, you know? So there is definitely something to be said about printing. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, to your point, one of my quickest adoptions from a metal 3D printing from a traditional is when customers have manifolds or other things that they traditionally have investment casted, but their demand is only like 12 a year or, mm-hmm. you know, like it's pretty, pretty low. It's, that's an easy sell to your point. Like they don't need to do a post, 
especially if it's a manifold and has something flowing through it. A yeah. lot of times you get a cast and then you post seal it to prevent, because sometimes casts have voids in it and you don't want the void to be right on your like O-ring or something. Yeah. But the sealing actually causes its own problems because it can gunk up or round out a surface or like have, you can't see inside the part. They've uh, you know, found like when you do a direct print, you know, metal, metal 3D print, you don't have to worry. Voids are just not a thing. Like it's just, right. it's like, but the, but everything else is the same. So they may even already have their post machine CNC set up for the cast net shapes. Mm-hmm. And they can literally just take that DMLS part and put it in their same setup and do the porting or whatever else. And it's, oh, wow. it, that one is actually like, for me, that's like the easy sell. It's like, it's like the one-to-one, like, especially a uh, um, DMLS aluminum tends to be a um, silicon based aluminum, which is very similar to what you would do if you were doing a, you know, investment cast part. Right, right. Well, the last article here is for one of our new guys, which I don't know a lot about. Maybe you do, but Velo 3D. Mm -hmm. Velo 3D will be going public and they will take their metal powder bed fusion into some new territory. The article goes on to say over the last six months, added manufacturing has been riding a wave that has not been seen in the last decade, much of it due to COVID. But one of the youngest companies to enter the metal additive industry which will be going public, which just announced very soon, is Velo 3D, the third of the added manufacturing mm-hmm. company in the last three quarters, just like Mark Those Ford. Those yeah. Yeah. SPAC, man. So, so yeah. what's the deal? Uh, what, what is this? Are they going to have their own printer? Is that what they're doing? Or? So, Velo does have a printer. It's called the Sapphire. And so, Velo is very much like direct metal laser, laser centering. So, yeah. you have a you have your build platform, you have a powder bed, the powder bed, like a, a laser will go and etch, you know, the, your single layer and that powder bed with support structures, it'll actually etch into that base plate and then grow the part from the bottom to the top. So the mechanics are the same. Okay. The sensors and the software are what it makes Velo, you know, a really powerful platform. So they have um, some intellectual property in their software that makes them different. Yeah. So they do, they, they do more digital twinning is what I'll call it than a lot of other companies. So you create your, you, you have your, your design file and you're able to essentially simulate the actual properties of what's going to happen when I grow this part in that orientation in that build, in that build chamber. And uh-huh. it does, and it will figure out, okay, based off the thermal properties, the material, I may flex this way or may curve like a potato chip or do something like this. And it can do some pre-deformation of that file. Nice. Automatically, like not, not yeah. without you like tweaking of, of something like that to help manage the outcome. Okay. By doing that as well, it's, it's able to change on the fly certain things about the laser pattern, how it's scanning. And it has some, like what I'll call some mechanical behavior changes, like the recode is actually a bladeless recode. So you don't, you oh. don't snag, snag apart by accident, ruin your build. But it's doing all this essentially to create the shape that you intend to. And with these better thermal controls, in some cases, you can actually build parts without the requirement for support structure. Now, wow. there, there should be like a thousand asterisks going above my head right now because <laughs> there's, it's a very unique use case. Like, so like when I build parts without, I could mitigate the supports. I could uh, probably in a Velo platform, I could probably remove like half the supporting required on any given part, which is a big deal because you know, it just, it takes a machine shop to remove them a lot of you times. You gotta cut them off later, right, right. Yeah. But if imagine if the part had a beard, you know, to uh-huh. it. so like something that just pointed down to an acute angle and then grew out and created the part. What it can do is actually kind of start centering that beard that's you know vectoring down, pointing down, and grow like one, then two, then four, then eight, and and essentially from there grow off that beard, which is, creates like a thermal root almost in the build chamber, and build uh-huh. build uh-huh. up. So in certain geometries, you can free float parts. It's okay. not as freeform as HPMJF or SLS, where I could just literally say like, all right, you just need to be two millimeters away from your neighbor and you're cool. Like, you know, it's, it's, it still has rules to it. Okay. But with that software pre-deformation and some insight to that, like during this printing, it's doing visual inspections and, and having some corrections being made while it's printing. It is much more reliable and predictable process, which is exactly what aerospace and high demand industries need. Okay. Uh, because because the qualification of saying, did you just print what you said you print? It's sometimes really difficult with metals. Right. Now, excuse my ignorance, but you mentioned uh, that this is a SPAC deal, S-P-A-C. <laughs> what, what is that for, for those of us who don't know? Oh what my is gosh. a SPAC deal? I'm, 
hold on, let me Google to make sure I say this right. <laughs> it's a special acquisition, like special purpose acquisition company. Okay, um, so, so certain companies fund this kind of thing and make them go public and... Correct. So SPAC companies tend to have large wallets and they, they tend to be on the marketplace or on, on like a, on, on the stock market. Okay. And okay. by acquiring that company, they're instantly able to elevate that company to a public, a public offering without a IPO. And it allows these companies to get, you know, large influx of cashes, you know, and especially if they have a, you know, nice evaluation and kind of innovate, you know, at a, at a rapid speed. That is my extreme layman's because I don't, I'm not an expert in that, <laughs> right, but right. it seems like SPAC is just all the rage this year. Well, it's, it, uh, it sounds like yeah. from this article, uh, that's what happened with Mark Borge and Desktop Metal. So yep. some of the some of the players we've seen on the market, they they were also part of something like that. Shape, like Shapeways too. Okay. Shapeways just just announced a, a SPAC. So okay, um, that's that's something, uh, and it's, it's interesting. And, and like so, these and some of these things are getting evaluated like two billion dollars. I think Shapeways are around six hundred, like five hundred, six hundred million. Okay, um, but like you know these these massive evaluations uh, yeah. um, that are coming through. Well, and maybe, and maybe both this, this metal from, from Beamit and, and Velo 3Ds, uh, maybe Geometry will start utilizing some of those in the future once uh, you do your due diligence and figure out if you can uh, approve it. There are no competitors. There are only, there are only potential suppliers. And that's, 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 that's the exciting thing. We're, we're here to be friendly. Yeah. I love it. And don't forget to, to put my plug in, uh, Geometry with an X factor. I like. I like geometry that. Geometry with um, X factor. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, thank you so much for today. We learned a lot. Can't wait to see uh, good things with geometry here in the future, and looking forward to more conversations with you. Yeah, this has been an awesome conversation, and it's it's just really exciting that you also have that manufacturing supplier experience, and that you used our quoting site too. So it's I love the feedback, and yeah, if there's uh, anything that I can answer more for your um, for your listeners, so, you know, my name is Greg Paulson. You can always connect on LinkedIn or check us out at zometry.com. So it's x-o-m-e-t-r-y.com. Or Z, if or, you, or uh... Zom. <laughs> or I think I think we even have zom.com, x-o-m.com. If you really there you want. go, there you go. Thanks again, Greg. We look forward to it and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks so much.